before he would call his disciples or confound the Pharisees, before he would be cheered as a celebrity or crucified as a criminal. Jesus lived a quiet life of obscurity in a nowhere town called Nazareth. These were years of growth and preparation, culminating in the public proclamation of his purpose. Join us as we turn to the Gospel of Luke and discover the backstory of Jesus, the most widely known yet profoundly misunderstood person who ever lived. As you uncover the truth of the real Jesus, you'll find the source of your own story's significance. I'm very glad that you're here today as we continue to move through the Gospel of Luke and move into chapter, second part of chapter three and into chapter four. And to kick it off, let me ask you a question. Are you a typical American? Here's what I mean. If you are a typical American, you have seen one movie since January 1st. You're about to see a second one because the average is about two per month in our country. And you have watched several TV shows or TV episodes and you will keep doing that all year. Um, Denise and I are watching a brand new episode, a series that we just ran into this weekend called Hannah. And I mean, it is every night when we hold hands, we're going like, gosh, what could happen next? Uh, confession, umbrella of grace from you, please. We just finished Ted Lasso and uh, great storyline, lots of life lessons to learn and do not watch this with your children. Uh, you will be very embarrassed and they will be saying, mom and dad, you're so cool. Do not be cool. Do not be cool. Now, why do we love movies so much? Why do we love TV shows and series so much? The answer is because we love stories. Donald Miller says it this way. The human brain is wired for story. That is, we are made to think, we're created to think of our lives as a story. We learn from stories. If you don't believe me on that, um, give somebody a series of statistics for 10 seconds, watch their eyes, or simply tell them the beginning of a story for 10 seconds. The first one, they are checking out. The second one, they are with you. In fact, your whole life is a story, isn't it? And in every story that you care about, there's always a character who faces a test. That test is a challenge to their identity to see whether they will live up to their identity or below their identity. And it will prepare them for their future. Now today we're gonna look at Jesus and how he understood his story how Satan tested him to not live up to his identity to see if Jesus really believed his story. And you will also see that knowing who you are, just like knowing who Jesus was, will help you through your tests and temptations because it was Jesus' awareness of who he was that allowed him to handle the difficulties of Satan and to come out on the far side courageously and completely dependent upon God. And it is only as we know who we are that we can do the very same in life. Here's the bottom line I want you to keep at the forefront of your mind throughout this message. Because Jesus knew who he was, he could withstand the tests and temptations he faced. And I believe the same is true for you, every one of us. So we're going to ask three questions about Jesus, and then we're going to run ourselves through that same series of three questions. So here's question number one about Jesus. Who was he? Who was Jesus? If the title of today's message is Jesus knew who he was, then who was he? Now, we're going to be moving into Jesus' baptism in the middle of chapter 3 and Jesus' temptations in chapter 4. And you'll notice that this is Jesus going public. He is no longer in quiet little podunk backwater Nazareth working with his uh, father, listening to his mother, relating to his brothers and sisters and a handful of townsfolk. Jesus is now getting ready to go public. And here's how verses 21 and 22 read. One day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. As he was praying, the heavens opened, the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. Now, this is not the first time that Jesus has ever heard the thought that he is God's son. In fact, I said two weeks ago, I believe that when he was 12 years old in Jerusalem, talking with the religious leaders and the experts in the law, that he knew he was God's son. In fact, when Mary came back looking for him, he said to her, mother, why are you looking for me? Didn't you know I needed to be in my father's house? So he already knew he had a very deep relationship with God, but it needed to be reaffirmed. So one day Jesus went to the Jordan River to be baptized by his cousin, his relative John. And he's praying. Now, I don't know if that means that he entered the water praying, if when he went underwater, he was praying, if the whole thing was wrapped in prayer. <laughs> 
But I do know that at all the important moments of his life, Jesus prayed. When he chose the 12 disciples, he prayed all night beforehand. When he went into Gethsemane the night before crucifixion, he was praying. When he was on the cross, he was praying. So every time there's something important, Jesus enters into a time of prayer. Now, as he prays here, three things occur. He emerges from the water and he sees and hears three things. The first is the heavens opened up. Now, I don't know what that looked like, but in my mind, it looked something like this. Just somehow the clouds parted, the sky was brighter, the sun was stronger, and it's as though the temporary barrier between heaven and earth for that moment, maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds, was just dissolved. And it was like for the first time, the heavens and the earth were all one. Maybe an image of what they will be one day when there's a new heavens and a new earth. God removed for just that split second, that visible barrier. Then the Holy Spirit swooped down on Jesus and landed on him and everyone else. It looked just like a dove. I mean, it was something in bodily form. And then the father spoke audibly and said, you are my son. I love you. You fill me with great joy or I'm pleased with you. And before you go any further, I just want to ask you to notice right here the genius and the mystery and the beauty of the God whom Christians worship. We believe he is one as our Jewish fathers and mothers all believe. Hero Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. But as Christians, we believe that that one is also three in a mysterious way. And while there's no word Trinity right here, look at this passage. The Father speaks to the Son. The Spirit comes down and fills the Son. The Son hears the words of the Father. I mean, you get the whole spirit of the Trinity right there. Now, as I said, what Jesus heard wasn't new to him. And the reason it wasn't new is because he knew Scripture so well. For example, he knew he was the son because he'd been reading the Psalms and he'd come across the Messianic Psalm, Psalm 2, verse 7, where the king says, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Jesus knew that. And he knew that when he heard the father say, you are my son, he thought, boom, he's talking to me. That's a Messianic Psalm about the Messiah one day. He knew that he was beloved, that he brought great joy to his father because he knew the story of God testing Abraham in Genesis 22, where God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love so much, beloved. He knew that even as Isaac was Abraham's beloved, so he was the beloved of his father. And he knew that he brought God great joy and pleased God because he knew the servant songs, the servant teachings in Isaiah. Here's the first one in Isaiah 42 that Jesus saw immediately as a connection to this moment at his baptism. Look at my servant, the Lord says, whom I strengthened. He is my chosen one who pleases me, brings me joy. I put my spirit like a dove coming down upon him. Now, Jesus knew that he was indeed the servant that God was sending. But when you read in Isaiah, there are four times a servant is mentioned from chapter 42 through chapter 53. And as it goes, as, as the passages go forward in Isaiah, you realize that at first there's this broad picture of a servant who's loved by God and chosen by God and bring God's great, brings God great joy. And it's kind of the nation of Israel. But by the time it narrows down in Isaiah 53, it's one person. And he is going to go through a very difficult life of substitutionary suffering for God's people. Look at Isaiah 53, because Jesus knew this applied to him too. My servant was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. The description of Jesus when he was tried before Pilate and when he was crucified. Jesus knew all those scriptures, Psalm 2, Genesis 22, Isaiah 42, and Isaiah 53. He knew who he was because the scriptures had told him who he was. And at his baptism, God simply reaffirmed Jesus' identity. He was the beloved son, the Messiah from Psalm 2, and he was the suffering servant. Jesus knew who he was. So far, so good. But now the tension enters the story through an evil presence. Question two, who was Jesus' enemy? We read about it in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River, was led by the Spirit in the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. Jesus' enemy was the devil, the same evil spirit who tempted Adam and Eve in the garden, who harassed and cajoled and made Job's life miserable, and who tested and tempted Jesus throughout his entire ministry. The devil, also called Satan. That means he's an opposer, an attacker, an adversary, an enemy. And I would say it like this. The devil opposes 
all that is good and true and kind and just. And he promotes all that is evil and false and hateful and unfair. So if at any point in your life you've ever seen anything that is good or true or kind or just, I just want you to know that's from God and Satan hates it. If you've ever seen anything that is evil and false and hateful and unfair, that is not from God and Satan loves it and promotes it and makes a lot out of it. Now, how did Jesus get approached by Satan? That is, did Satan come to Jesus uh, in physical form so that Jesus looked at him and they were like mano a mano, eye to eye, hand to hand, face to face? I don't know. I don't think so. I think if Jesus had seen, had seen Satan as he was, he would have said, I know who you are. Leave me alone. I'll never listen to what you say. I think on the contrary, Satan came to Jesus the way he comes to us, which is through our thoughts, spirit, heart, mind. And so all of a sudden we have a thought that comes to us and we wonder, I wonder if that's good or if that's bad. And there's like a voice that says, eh, you don't want to go that direction. There's another voice that says, go that direction. And we play around with a little bit. And if we fall to the temptation, we go, ah, let's do it. Who cares? God's not looking and God doesn't really care. So how did the enemy attack and how did Jesus respond? That's our third question. Well, the scripture tells us Jesus was tempted by Satan for 40 days. That's a long time, but I want you to look at the word tempt. The word tempt in the Old and the New Testament, Hebrew and Greek, is the very same word as the word test. Now, sometimes that's hard for us to grasp because a temptation and a test seem so different. Although, if you hated tests in school as much as I hated tests, then they both fall into the category of evil. <laughs> in fact, the Greek word pyrosmos can mean test or trial, and we never know how to translate it until we see the context, and then we can see which one it is. So how can we know? Well, here's what I think. I think that when it's a temptation, Satan uses it to tear down your faith. And I think that when it is a test, God uses it to build up your faith. And you may be thinking to yourself, Paul, are you saying that one event could be simultaneously a test and a temptation? Yes, I think it can be. In fact, perhaps it often is. For example, let's say that you decide to let your 12-year-old spend the night with a friend this next weekend. Well, in the spirit of goodness, you are simply testing their maturity. Will they do well and handle that responsibility well? Of course, when kids get together, that experience could wind up as a temptation. We all know that. We were at parties where it became a temptation instead of a test, or maybe it was both. Let's go to a different example, one that's higher and one that's on our minds a lot. In fact, it's a word that's not a four-letter word, but that should be. It's 11 letters, coronavirus. I hate it. I try not to say it hardly ever, but we can't get away from it. It's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> now, when I think of the coronavirus in these terms, I don't think God sent it. I also don't think Satan sent it. Here's the point. I don't know either one of those true statements is true, but it just doesn't make sense to me personally. It's beyond my pay grade to understand either one of those things. God knows it, and to my knowledge, God has not told anyone. But God wants this experience to build up your faith and not to tear you down. God wants this experience to strengthen you and not weaken you. God wants through this experience to build into you what the Apostle Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. That is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what God wants to use this experience to do in your life and in my life. But do not be mistaken. Satan is going the whole opposite direction. Satan wants this experience to tear down your faith, to weaken your moral character, and your integrity, and to increase not the fruit of the Spirit, but what the Apostle Paul calls in Galatians 5, the opposite of the fruits of the Spirit, which are the works of the flesh. Can I just read these to you so you remember what Satan seeks to do in all of our lives through something like the coronavirus or anything else that is difficult? Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, envy, evil, drunkenness, and that's just 13. Did any of those have an uptick in your life after coronavirus hit in March of 2020? For a lot of us, a whole lot of that had an uptick. 
Why? Because Satan wanted to use it for his purposes. Now, nobody knows when this silly virus is going to calm down. And until then, you can either let it tear you down or you can let it build you up. You can either let the evil one have his way or you can let God have his way. Now, I believe there's a principle here, and here's the principle. In every challenging moment, God is testing you and Satan is tempting you. But it's your response that makes all the difference. All right, three temptations are highlighted here out of dozens. Remember, it said that for 40 days, Jesus was tempted. We get the three biggies. And here's the first one in verses three and four. Then the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, no. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Now the devil begins here as he usually does by planting a seed of doubt in Jesus' mind. He uses the phrase, if, if you are the son of God. Does that remind you of the words that the serpent spoke to Adam and Eve in the wilderness? Did God, I mean, in the Garden of Eden, did God really say that you can't take of the fruit of that particular tree? Are you sure God said that? Satan loves to make us question God and to distrust God. And then he makes his play. And he says, tell this stone, since you're so hungry, to become bread and eat it. Take care of yourself. Now, why was this a real temptation of Jesus? Because if these were not real temptations of Jesus, then this whole experience that we're learning today is a sham. But if these were real temptations to Jesus, let's find out why. Why was, this, why was Jesus vulnerable to this first temptation? Well, first, he was hungry. He had not eaten in 40 days. Any of you ever gone 40 days without eating? I often can't go 40 minutes. <laughs> there was an occasion in my life about a decade where I went to a Catholic retreat center north of Birmingham. Um, it's called St. Bernard's Abbey. It was a monastery. And I went up there every three months for 24 hours to fast and pray. I know it was a dark time in my life and I really needed to fast and pray and to sense God's call in my life again. Well, the longest I ever fasted was 24 hours. And even then I had all the coffee, all the water and all the Gatorade I could handle. Imagine 40 days. And then someone says, you got the power. <laughs> Turn these rocks to bread. And Jesus did have the power to do that. Remember, it wasn't long just maybe a few months later, that he would turn just a couple of loaves into a banquet for thousands. So he had the ability to do it. And I believe Jesus was asking, you know, what kind of Messiah am I? Am I allowed to use my power to meet my own needs like this right here, or am I not? And he was asking, what kind of God is God? If he is my father, and if he loves me, how long will he let me go hungry? Can I really trust him to provide for me everything I need, including right now when I'm really hungry? Well, after the full weight of that temptation fell on Jesus, he answered the devil with the word of God. He said, humans don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from God's mouth. Meaning humans are more than animals. Animals have to eat. Humans need to eat, but they need God even more. Now, I want you to notice that in all three of these temptations, Satan will always respond with Scripture, which means he knew Scripture well. And sometimes people make the assumption, oh, if I just memorize Scripture, I'll always do better in temptation. I think that's too simplistic. You need to memorize Scripture because it's God's Word. It replaces old tapes with new tapes, lies with truth. But just memorizing it doesn't help. You have to do something with it. And it's an important thing I want to show you right now. Jesus didn't just know Bible verses he knew God's voice. You can know dozens of Bible verses, but if you still can't discern the voice of God from the voice of the evil one, you're in trouble. If you learn those verses and allow the truth to go deep into your mind and into your heart and out to your hands and your feet, then you'll begin to understand and discern the voice of God over and over so that you'll be able to handle temptations when they come. Temptation number two verses five, six, seven, and eight. Then the devil took him up, revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I'll give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if, there's that word, if you will worship me. Jesus replied, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Now I think Jesus sees in his mind's eye every nation, every kingdom, every power in the world. And Satan says, now this is all mine. You can have it. Just one requirement, bow down right now. 
look carefully, Satan uses two ploys here. The first is a half-truth. Because the world is, in some sense, under Satan's control. Jesus said, or the Apostle Paul said, he is the prince of the power of the air. Jesus called him the God of this world. But he does all of that only under God's ultimate authority and provision. And one day when Satan is out of the picture and there's a new heavens and a new earth and God's restored everything the way he always intended, Satan will have no power. He certainly has no power that God does not grant him now. So that's the half-truth. Then he used the ploy of trickery. He was trying to trick Jesus into compromising because every time you and I get right goals and wrong methods, there's trickery involved. It was the right goal for Jesus to rule the world because one day he would. But it was the wrong method to say that it's now by bowing to Satan. Now, why would this have appealed to Jesus? Well, I think first, because he knew he would have all authority one day, he wondered if this was the time. And I think he was asking, I've been waiting 30 years. When will my time come? If I'm really the son of God, why not now? This world is full of evil, I think he said. God hates sin, I hate sin. God hates evil, I hate evil. Evil destroys people. If I take over now, it's not gonna hurt anyone anymore. Why not now? And again, after the full weight of that temptation sat on Jesus, he responded again with a word from God, worship and serve the Lord only. Now Jesus knew that yes, he was the son of God, but also that yes, he was the suffering servant. And he knew that he would never get the crown God designed for him unless he went through the cross that God also designed for him. There was no way for him to experience ultimate exaltation if he did not experience ultimate humiliation. No cross, no crown. Jesus knew it in his gut. He knew the only way to rule the world was to suffer and to die for it. And therefore, until that time, he would trust God in his ways. Temptation 3, verses 9 through 12. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if, there's the word, if you're the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Now the devil takes him again, again, I think in the eyes of Jesus to the highest point of the temple in Jerusalem. Now this would be the southeast corner looking over the Kidron Valley. And while we don't know what it looked like back then, we know what it looks like today. This is the wall around the temple, and even though this wall is more like 1,500 years old instead of 2,000 years old over here, down there it's the original wall. Here's the point. That's the highest level. This is the Kidron Valley. If the Kidron Valley were not built up, that would be a 450-foot drop, also known as about 30 stories. And the devil says, if you're really the son of God, jump off the highest point in Jerusalem right here off the corner of the temple, and as you do that, the angels will swoop down, scoop you up before your head ever hits the ground because God will care for you. Now, why was Jesus vulnerable to that temptation? I mean, first off, because the enemy was speaking Jesus' language. He was quoting from Scripture, from the 91st Psalm. But Satan was misusing Scripture. He was only sharing a portion of it, hoping to try to trick Jesus. And let me say today, tell you today that Satan still loves to misuse Scripture. So when you read the Word of God... Read it wisely, read it prayerfully, research and study, listen to people you trust, listen to podcasts and read books of those who know. Because otherwise, the devil can also use the word of God in a negative way, just like he does right here. And I think Jesus was asking the question, what is wrong with getting God to prove that he loves me? If I'm really the son of God, and if he's really eternally committed to me, then why can't he protect me right here, right now? Again, after the full weight of the temptation fell on Jesus, he responded with the scripture, do not test the Lord your God. Jesus saw through Satan's trickery because the trickery was this. Satan was trying to get Jesus to write a check that God couldn't cash. And you and I are often tempted to presume upon God and to test God in a foolish way and to try to get God to cash a check by something that we promise that God will have to do for us or for other people. All right, those are three temptations. And when I look at those three temptations, I see a common thread all the way through. And it's this, is God trustworthy? 
That's what Satan was making Jesus focus on and process through. That is, if God is love, will he keep me healthy, wealthy, and wise? If God is love, will he give me everything that's rightfully mine right now? If God is love, will he protect me no matter what? And it's at this point that Jesus' understanding of God and of life and of human suffering is so far beyond ours that we need to learn. Here's what I believe Jesus understood. Jesus knew that God's love sent him into the world. He was clear about that. And that the cross was the only way the world could be saved. He was clear about that. And for him, this was not a contradiction. For most of us, that becomes a contradiction. To hear God whisper to us, I love you. I care for you so deeply. I'm so glad you're my child. And by the way, you're going to suffer in these ways in life. We're going, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, uh-uh, no suffering, no suffering. If you love me, make my life a bed of roses. If you love me, make it easy. And if it's not easy and it's not a bed of roses, if there are thorns in there, then I know you don't love me. And for Jesus, there was no contradiction. Years ago, Corrie ten Boom and her sister were stuck in a Nazi prison camp, a death camp. And although she survived it, she and her sister went through some of the worst sufferings and she watched her sister die there. Here's one of the comments she made later in life. She said, there is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. And the reason she said that is because when you look at Jesus on the cross, you can't get deeper than that pit. So if today you're in the pits and you're blaming God for your pit, let me just tell you, God is with you and he has gone deeper still than whatever you are in. Now, that is the story of Jesus. What about you? Well, of course, the first question is, who are you? The good news? Hey, you're not the Messiah. You're not the unique son of God who existed forever with the Father. You're not the suffering servant. We had one. He suffered well. You don't have to do that in his place. But you are a child of God. You are a son or a daughter of your heavenly Father. You are a younger sister, a younger brother to your older brother, Jesus. You are a part of the body of Christ, a citizen of the kingdom of God, but somebody doesn't want you to know your true identity. And that someone is your enemy. Question two, who is your enemy? (laughs) Your enemy is Jesus' enemy. What else would it be? You're his follower. So don't be surprised when you face attacks and temptations and tests like he did. Now, they won't be identical because... um, Since you and I are not the son of God on whose shoulders we must bear the burden of the sin of the world, we're not going to be tempted to jump off the height of the temple or to take all the kingdoms of the world or to turn rocks into stones. Those aren't real temptations for us, but they point to the kinds of temptations that we will always face. And Satan is always looking for an opportunity to get you and me to veer off God's course and onto our course or his course, which generally are about the same thing. Simon Peter messed up a lot in his life and had some great successes. So he knows what he means when he writes this near the end of his life. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. What an image. Your enemy is Jesus' enemy. Second, your enemy is not God, nor your spouse, nor your kids, nor your boss, nor any other of the usual suspects. I say that because one of my friends at Preston Trail told me this last week, Paul, it's easy for people. It's easy for me, easy for my friends. When things are going bad and it doesn't change for a season to assume that God is the problem or someone else. And yet the apostle Paul is super clear in Ephesians chapter six when he writes these words. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. That's who is our real enemy. So when you and I feel like it's right to villainize God because we're in a season of suffering, just remember, God is not your enemy. So then how does the enemy attack you? And how can you respond? Well, first off, you need to know the enemy's tactics. And that means that your enemy does not fight fair. My sister first told me this when she was chaplain at Cook's Children's Hospital, where she was a chaplain in the oncology unit, working with children and families of children. And many of those children died uh, long after long suffering and horrendous experiences. And one day she just came home and was worn out. We were talking on the phone and she said, you know, Paul, she said, Satan does not fight fair. I took notice because she's the smartest Bayesian I've ever met. That's a fact. 
And I thought, okay, I'm going to remember that. And she's exactly right. Satan never fights fair. He lies. He twists the truth. He accuses. He plants seeds of suspicion and doubt. He will do anything to get you to distrust God. He will tempt you at every point that is important to your life and to the calling he has on your life. He will tempt you at the point of faithfulness to your spouse, to raising up your children to be godly children. He will tempt you at the point of serving others rather than lording it over them because you're so much better. He will tempt you at the point of sexual integrity, of ignoring and judging other people who don't look or sound like you. He will tempt you at the point of anger and hatred. And while this is going on, please don't think the evil one is creative. The evil one's not creative. Remember the piece of cake you fell for last week? Just like the piece of cake you fell for last month. That's not creative. Remember the image on the computer you fell for last week? Just like the, the, piece, the face on the computer that you fell for last month. That's not creative. God's creative, not Satan. Someone said God has created 19,000 flies. That's how creative. 19,000 types of flies. That's how creative God is. If any of you understands that, please email me this week. <laughs> Why in the world would God give us 19,000 kinds of flies? No idea. But God's creative. Satan is not creative. For Satan, it is the same old, same old, over and over, the same game plan since the beginning of time. Get humans to believe lies about God and lies about who they really are. But while your enemy doesn't fight fair, be sure to know that your enemy can't stand or stand against God's truth. So learn God's truth. Meditate on it. Memorize it. Read it. Study it. Learn his truth. Pack away in your heart, in your mind, as many scripture passages as you can. Not because they're magic. As I said earlier, you must learn to discern God's voice in the midst of all those verses. Let it change how you think. Let God's word disciple you more than social media disciples you, more than cable news disciples you, more than pop culture disciples you. Let Luke's gospel and Jesus be your ultimate disciple maker right now. And don't go it alone. As Sonia said, in care groups, we need one another. In small groups, we need one another. People who have been through temptations with us and will love us when we fall and help us to be picked back up and help us not fall so hard the next time. And remind yourself who you are in the eyes of God. And I would ask you today, do you know who you are in the eyes of God? Do you know your identity in Jesus Christ? We sang it earlier. Do you remember it? I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You're for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am a child of God. <laughs> That's who I really am. And I can't think of anything better for us as we close this service than to sing that. So I've asked Warren to come out and just lead us in this so that our hearts and our minds can have that truth fill us, just the refrain. And I think you're going to resonate with this now after this scripture passage more than ever. Warren. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Let's sing that together. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am. You are for me. Not against me, I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. And that's exactly who you are. You're a child of God. Yes, you are. And so claim that, friends. Next time the evil one comes at you with fury, uh, take yourself lightly. You're not the first one he's ever tempted. Jesus is on your side. He will give you grace. Just remember who you are. And so let's pray about that now. Oh, Jesus, remind us who we are. Because the world tells us a million things about our value, about our worth, about what makes us important, about what makes us cool, about what makes other people want to bow down when we come to their presence and say, I'm just not worthy. <laughs> Man, that's a world, and it's just filled with lies, and Satan is the god of this world and the prince of the power of this air, and this world reflects so much of his malignant spirit. And yet, you have placed within us your Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus, and you are building up in us 
faith, hope, and love so that when the evil one comes, we can choose a greater affection, loving you who loved us first. Remind me who we, us who we are, Lord, so we can serve you better this week. Through Christ we pray.